Good evening, and welcome back to night two of the Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation seminar. You might be thinking to yourself, that Jeff guy sure has changed in just a couple of days. The fact of the matter is, I'm not Jeff at all, and his wife is certainly glad of that. My name's Dave Stenhouse, and I'll be your host this evening. Our, uh, our topic tonight is Back to Jerusalem. And before we dive into this very important topic, we're going to uh, pause a moment for a musical interlude. Thank you so much. That was lovely. All right. Once again, Dave Stenhouse, your host this evening. Our topic, Back to Jerusalem. And I really want to go. You're really going to love this. I'm really excited about being able to present this topic to you. And I want to dive right in. But before we do that, let's just take a moment and bow before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word for desiring to spend time with your people, to desire, for your desire to share with us this important information about who you are and what your character is, how much you love us, and, uh, and, and these little tidbits of information that, that, we're, that we've uh, seen the other night's presentation and that we're going to see from the uh, presentations yet to come. Lord, I just ask that you'll anoint my lips, that the words that I speak will be yours and not mine. I ask that you will send your spirit to guide me, that you will send your spirit to guide everyone who is um, receiving this message, whether it's live or whether it's uh, later on through, uh, through a recording Whatever it is, however it is, we want your word to go forth because we know that wherever your word goes, it will not return to you without having first accomplished its purpose. And it is our purpose now, Lord, to learn of you, to become more like our Savior Jesus by beholding his beauty and his love. This we ask in that precious name. Amen. Our story tonight is found in the uh, book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. Luke, chapter 24, 13 through 32. We'll be jumping around a little bit, but uh, if you kind of, you know, put, put a little bookmark there, you're going to be good to go. Let's dive right in, shall we? The disciples of Jesus were completely devastated. 
all of their hopes and dreams for a new kingdom of God had been nailed to a cross the previous Friday. Reeling with grief and confusion, Cleopas and his companion slowly made the seven-mile trip from Jerusalem down to their little home in the town of Emmaus. As the sun was setting that Sunday afternoon, and they trod their way down a bumpy road, a stranger drew near to journey with them. Little did they know that this new traveling companion was the resurrected Lord himself. Paying little heed to their fellow pilgrim, the two dejected disciples rehashed the staggering events of the weekend, feeling more despondent with every step. As Jesus silently listened, he desperately longed to reveal himself to his downcast friends. But the Lord deliberately shielded his true identity because they needed now more than ever to understand the scriptures. If Christ had allowed these two faithful followers to recognize who he was, they would have been far too excited to listen to the important truths he had to share. Even after three and a half years of listening to his teaching and preaching, they still didn't comprehend the nature of his mission. He had plainly told them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after the third day that he is killed, he shall rise again. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. You'll see that without the uh, Dave paraphrase in the ninth chapter of Mark, verses 31 and 32. But as they walked, Jesus interrupted their conversation and for the next two hours, he gave them the keys for understanding all scripture and prophecy. Question one here, how much of the scriptures are we commanded to believe? Our answer, believe in all that the prophets have spoken. You see that in Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Hey, I'm having fun. And we also see all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 And it's worth remembering that as Paul writes this letter to Timothy, all Scripture did not include 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All right? The New Testament hadn't been compiled yet. All Scripture was what we now call the Old Testament. The, uh, the, complete, the complete sacred truth of God is contained in the writings of the Old and the New Testaments. And the keys to understanding the prophecies in Revelation are found primarily in the stories of the Old Testament. For example, a little trivia for you, of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of them are echoes from other stories and prophecies in the Old Testament. So friends, if you want to understand Revelation, where do we go? We go back to the scriptures as John understood the scriptures to be when he wrote the book of Revelation. Our next question whom did Jesus say the scriptures and the prophecies reveal? This is a great one. It says, In beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You find that, again, in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Can you imagine being sad and dejected and confused and not knowing which way was up, and as you're walking down that lonely road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, all of a sudden, there's Jesus. Now, you don't know it's Jesus, but he's expounding. He's giving you, hey, don't you remember reading Isaiah 53? Hey, don't you remember this? Hey, don't you remember that? And all of a sudden, doot, 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 that sticks get rubbed together and you get a little bit of light up in your head. Jesus also says in the book of John chapter 5, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, 
And these are they which testify of me. How about that? And finally here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the book of Revelation, and obviously we're here to uh, learn of the prophecies of Revelation. The very first words of the book of Revelation says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Can you imagine? Everybody says, oh, the book of Revelation, you can't understand that. It's a closed book. Oh, we're not supposed to look at the book of Revelation. It's revealing Jesus! How about that, friends? Not supposed to look? Oh, we better look. Because that's where we find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the central figure in all of Scripture, and certainly all of prophecy. And as we go through this series, you're going to see a lot of these themes open up and point to Jesus in different aspects of his ministry. Question number three. What is another name used in the Bible for Jesus? I'm sure everybody, well, most of you probably know this uh, scripture. John chapter 1, verse 1 is the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. How about that? Amen. Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came to show us the way to dwell with his people. Question number four. What kind of people did God use to write the Bible? This is an excellent question. I didn't write it, but it's still an excellent question. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men, by the will of man, I should say, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Question number five. Eternal life comes from knowing Jesus. We see that in John 17, 3. But how was Jesus known to his disciples? It says, he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Well, isn't that odd? Isn't that kind of funny that Jesus would be known to his disciples in the breaking of bread? You know, in the Bible, bread is a symbol of the word of God. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. See that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. As we read, take in, digest, and follow the scriptures, we will find strength, joy, peace, and everlasting life. How important should Bible study be to the Christian? Is it important for Christians to study the Bible? Probably. Here in Job chapter 23, Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In other words, and I've had plenty of food, obviously. Job says, more important then that calzone that I had for lunch is the word of God to me. Amen. You know, the devil hates the Bible, and he will do just about anything to prevent people from reading it. He doesn't want you to be reading your Bible. He doesn't want you to be taking part in this study tonight. And you've really got a purpose in your heart that you're going to stick with this and that you are going to learn what God wants you to learn, that you're going to know him better. He knows that the prophecies of the Bible, he the devil we're talking about here, he knows that the Bible's prophecies expose his plans to deceive the human race, and that means you and me. So don't be surprised if Satan tries to distract you or pull you away or get you preoccupied with other things. I will tell you that he's tried to do the same to Jeff and I and everyone else that's taken part in putting these meetings together. But God will make a way for those who seek and want to know the truth. God will make a way for you to find it. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Can it get any more clear than that? 
God's word is a light in the darkness, and he will guide us out of this, whatever darkness you're in right now, and bring you into his glorious light. Now, as we do that, as we read, who helps us understand the Bible? Is it Dave? Is it Jeff? No, it's not Dave or Jeff. It is when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Don't take my word for anything. Don't take Jeff's word for anything. Don't take our musician's word for anything. The truth is, the Bible and the Bible alone is your guide. And as you open a word, and as we go through these texts together, you just need to pray that the Spirit will guide you, that He will guide you into all truth. And that's my prayer for myself and my prayer for you as well. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, He will teach you all things. We also speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul gives us that extra bit of wisdom. If you are at a church and the preacher is preaching something that goes against what the Word of God says, you know that that is words of man's wisdom. And what you need to search after is not words of man's wisdom, but words which the Holy Spirit has taught, which will never run contrary to the Bible. Question number eight. What must I do to be certain the Holy Spirit is guiding my Bible study? It's a great question, right? We kind of talked about praying about it. And so here in Luke 11, 9, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. He also said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Will God give you the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Just ask. John 7:17, 7, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God. This is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's to understand the truth of the scriptures. That's why we have to ask the Spirit to guide us before we open up the Bible. Now, I know that I can be certain that the Holy Spirit is guiding my Bible study if, one, I ask Him to guide me, and two, I am willing to accept and to follow truth as He reveals it to me. And friends, i got to tell you, that one was scary to me for a long, long time. I wanted to read the Bible. I wanted to study the Bible. But I didn't necessarily want to do what the Bible said that I needed to do. Because I liked the way that I was running things in the good ship, Dave. Didn't work out. Having that willingness to accept and follow the truth, friends, there's nothing more important than that. Question number nine, how does prayerful study of the word help us? This is a great Psalm 119, 11. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever things were written for our, for written, let's back up a second. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Amen. And here in James chapter 1, verse 5, James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, that would be me, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you lack in wisdom... If you don't understand some of the words, some of the, the, the linguistics of the Bible, just pray about it. Ask God, and he will give you wisdom. Question number 10. What method of Bible study do the scriptures recommend? Did you know that there is indeed a specific method? Let's get into it. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, Line upon line, here a little, there a little. 
1 Corinthians 2, these things we also speak not in words which man wisdoms teaches, man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's what we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. What does that mean? That means that we need to lay aside our own ideas, our own concepts, those things that we think we know, and study the Bible by reading everything, everything in the Bible that has to do with that subject that we're studying. Hear a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, and comparing all those verses for input. By thus doing, we let the Bible speak for itself. And then we're not putting our ideas on top of God's word. We're letting God's word speak speak to us. And when we do this, the truth will come out clearly. And this is the method that Jesus used to convince those two disciples on the road to Emmaus that we started this study talking about, right? He said, he just started talking to him. He told him everything and all the prophecy that had to do with him. And they knew that he was the Messiah, right? And we know what they did next. Question 11. What will studying the scriptures do for us? 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul, writing to Timothy, says, Hey, Timothy, you know the Scriptures, and knowing the Scriptures means that you know God's plan of salvation. And that is the most important information ever, ever given to mortal man. Those Scriptures make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Simple intellectual knowledge isn't enough. Those words, those scriptures make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Question number 12. According to Jesus, where do we find the truth? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, 17 says, your word is truth. We find the truth in God's Word, the Bible. Truth is such a rare commodity in today's world, and really, every person on this earth suffers as a result. The fact is that the truth about everything that actually matters, you'll find in Scripture. And by studying and following the counsel that we find in Scripture, it will set you free. You read that in John chapter 8, verse 32 and will bring you a happy and abundant life. You see that in John 15, 11, I want to say. Question number 13. What warnings regarding Bible study are given in the Scriptures? Warnings, Dave. Warnings, I tell you. Let's take a look. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God truth. Be diligent, Paul says. In 2 Peter 3, 16, Peter, speaking about Paul, says, you know, in all his epistles are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. Now, I'm going to tell you, because I love you, There are things in the Bible that are hard to understand. Peter wasn't lying. But if you allow yourself to inject your own thoughts, your own ideas, your own desires onto those subjects, you will twist those things to your own destruction. So We need to be sure that we are rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a great deal of danger So once again, what Dave has to say about what we're studying tonight, what Jeff has to say about 
what we studied previous night, nights to come, doesn't matter. What matters is, what does the Word say? What's clear? When you stack up everything in the Bible about that subject, what is the outcome of that? That is how you rightly divide the Word of Truth. It ain't by listening to me. Question 14. How should we test all religious teachings and doctrines? Acts 17.11, speaking of uh, the Bereans, says they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. I got it. The Bereans were awesome people. We, sh we should spend a whole... Call me sometime. We're going to get together and we'll talk about the Bereans sometime. Awesome, awesome people. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So, once again, if we have a religious teaching, a religious practice, something that you've done since forever because that's what grandpa did and that's what his grandpa did all the way back till we ran out of grandpas, doesn't matter. To the law and to the testimony. What does the Bible say? Are we doing it because this is in the Word of God, or are we doing it because we've been doing it? If it's not in agreement with the Scriptures, get rid of it. Question 15. What happened when Jesus explained the Scriptures to his two discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus? Remember those guys? We were talking about them right at the beginning. What happened? Well, after he broke bread and they went, oh, it's Jesus! He vanished from their sight. And uh, what did they say to each other? They said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Didn't our heart burn within us? Oh, didn't our heart burn within us? After these two disciples knew that Jesus was alive and had heard him explain the prophecies, what did they do? Heartburn and all, what did they do? It says they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those that were with them gathered together. Now, don't mistake that the whole reason that they were breaking bread with Jesus there in Emmaus is because Jesus had kind of made out like he was going to keep going, and they said, nah, man, stranger, that we don't know who you are that just taught us everything about Jesus. It's getting late. You should, you know, crash at our place. We got some bread. But as soon as they realized what it, what, who that was, and they realized that Jesus was alive, all of a sudden it didn't matter that it was late. It didn't matter that they hadn't finished dinner yet. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven, and those that were with them gathered together. And friends, that only leaves us one more question. And this is the most important question that I have for you this evening. Do you want to fully understand and follow the Scriptures, God's Holy Word? I hope that you do. And I'll simply ask that you Bow your heads with me for a moment as we commit ourselves to this study and further knowledge of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, you've opened yourself to us this evening in this beautiful, beautiful story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It is one of the, one of the stories of the New Testament that just absolutely lights me up. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share this story with the brothers and sisters that are, that are uh, watching either live through the uh, um, whatever you call the thing or that pick it up on tape later on. Lord, you've opened your word to us. You've given us an idea of how to study your word. And I simply ask, Lord, that you will send your spirit to guide each one of us into a further knowledge of you. That we will, as we go through this study, 
learn more of you, fall in love with you more, and realize just how much you love us and that we will dedicate our lives to you, dedicate ourselves to spreading the gospel and teaching others what you have taught us. These things I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, friends, I'm not done just yet. Fooled you. Just want to go over a couple of things. Tuesday at 7 o'clock, Jeff will be bringing you uh, a message, the topic of the coming king. And then Thursday, uh, I'll be bringing you a topic on the Prince of Pride. And we'll probably be alternating, and, and you never know, we'll, we'll be playing this by ear somewhat as, uh, as my health allows. Um, you see here the, uh, the next couple of, uh, of presentations that we have for you. Um, I think Jeff laid out the total number is uh, 24, I want to say. And uh, stick with us. If you haven't learned anything yet, I promise you, you will. And finally, if you have any prayer requests or if you have any questions on things that we've covered, I want you to let us know. Uh, you can call that number on the screen, 919-533-5150. Hit option one, and it'll give you a voicemail box. Uh, you can also send a, a text message to that number. Or you can email us at uh, pittsburghbibleguy at gmail.com. Thank you so much again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.